Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us from the many lands around Australia and overseas. And of course to those of you who have joined us here in the beautiful Hans and Dyer Hall today. My name is Georgie McLean and I'm the Executive Director of Development and Strategic Partnerships at Australia Council for the Arts. In this era of understudies and plan B's, C's and D's, I'm taking the role of Kristen Cornell today, who has done an extraordinary job for the Australia Council in bringing all this work together. I'm standing on the lands of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to begin today's event by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of this land and paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you to all of our First Nations colleagues who are joining us today. We have so much to learn from First Nations understandings of the deep connections between culture, country, and individual and community well-being. I'd like to thank the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music for hosting us today, and the University of Melbourne's Creativity and Wellbeing Hallmark Research Institute for their collaboration on today's event. This morning's panel discussion sits within a wider program of work that is seeking to embed arts and creativity in programs to support mental health and well-being. Some of you may have joined the Australia Council's Arts and Wellbeing Forum, which was held online in November last year, and which began some of these discussions about how, through participation in the arts, we can better support the mental health of all Australians. Since that November event, we have progressed a series of discussions with key stakeholders from the arts, health, government and community sectors, all of which are working towards refining policy proposals on how we can better link the arts and mental health sectors and how we can embed culture and wellbeing across portfolios. These policy proposals will be taken to government later this year. Our partners in this wider policy development work include the Federal Government's Creative Economy Task Force, the Office for the Arts, the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, Creative Victoria, the University of Sydney, University of New South Wales' Big Anxiety Research Centre and Black Dog Institute, and of course, our hosts today, the University of Melbourne and its Creativity and Wellbeing Hallmark Initiative. Today's event is being recorded and will be available on the Australia Council webpage after today. In fact, I've been told that while we have a wonderful live community audience in the room joining us online, we also have 1,100 for this conversation. So the discussion will certainly have a digital life. And now I'd like to introduce Professor Marie Sierra, Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music, to help welcome us to the event. Thank you so much, Georgie. The Faculty of Fine Arts and Music at the University of Melbourne is home to the Victorian College of the Arts and the Conservatorium of Music. For those of us with you here today uh, in this lovely room, welcome to the faculty uh, and to our beautiful campus. In March 2019, the majority of the Conservatorium of Music moved from the Parkville campus, uh, which is the main campus of Melbourne University, here to South Bank in the Ian Potter South Bank building where we now meet. And this is a state-of-the-art facility for music performance, teaching, research, and learning. The lovely Hanson Dyer Hall, where we are now, is named after Louise Hanson Dyer, one of the most renowned patrons for music in the world. And she left us an incredibly generous bequest. We have a free concert here every Tuesday night this semester. For those of you who are in town or, or live in Melbourne, um, we are certainly welcome to come along to that. It's at 7.30 every Tuesday. This new building me means that the South Bank campus of the university is the largest creative tertiary education provider situated inside an arts precinct in the country and one of the very few in the world to be so located. Our close neighbors include the National Gallery of Victoria, the Arts Centre Melbourne, the Melbourne Theatre Company, which is a department of the university, the Melbourne Recital Centre, the Australian Ballet, the ABC, the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art, Malthouse Theatre, and Chunky Move. And that's just who we are very close to. There are many others nearby. Long recognised as one of the leading providers of fine arts and music education in Australia, the faculty has celebrated 150 years of the School of Art. It was originally founded as part of the National Gallery of Victoria. And 128 years for the Conservatorium of Music's location within the university. 
This year is a special one, because we're also celebrating 50 years of the BCA as a whole, and 20 years for the Willen Center of Indigenous Arts and Cultural Development. You're here today to talk about arts and well-being, a subject about which we are all passionate. We all understand the value of arts to provide us connection to one another, connection to place, a sense of identity and belonging. The arts can transport us mentally and emotionally to the past or various futures, can challenge us intellectually, and speak to us both individually and collectively. The Faculty of Fine Arts and Music is dedicated to understanding and implementing practices that articulate the relationship between arts, creativity, and well-being. We do this through research, teaching, and practice. And as Georgie mentioned, we host the university's Creativity and Wellbeing Research Initiative, or CAWRI as we call it, which engages with researchers from almost every faculty across the university. We are home to the Willen Center, which I mentioned earlier, the Willen Center for Indigenous Arts and Cultural Development, which centers indigenous philosophies of practice in the academy and society. And it does this through arts, arts research, practice, training, and various partnerships. We have developed a culture of excellence in music therapy and creative arts therapies through the Creative Arts and Music Therapy Research Unit, which supports the development of creative arts therapy disciplines across Australia and internationally through research and research teaching. We work nationally and internationally in areas as diverse as social justice, mental health, adaptive aging, disability, performance science, and everyday life management. Through our tart taught courses, we offer professional skills and training across creative and performing arts, including engaging students with health, well-being, social and psychological insights to help them contribute to society as artists, some leaving with skills as facilitators, social psychologists, and performance scientists. The relationship of arts, creativity, and well-being is increasingly acknowledged in these, dare we say, post-COVID times, or after what we've been through, I think, as contributing to quality of life and finding routes to provide all Australians with access to such benefits that are higher on our agenda of being well, being happy, and contributing to society. So the faculty is really delighted to host today's event, and we are looking forward to continuing our partnership with the Australia Council in this important area. I hope things go really well for you today, and welcome to the faculty. Thank you, Marie, for that warm welcome, and so, so lovely to be in the site of so many fantastic conversations in this obviously cultural hotspot that we're in. It is now my great pleasure to hand over to the fabulous Faye Akandriani, long-term collaborator of the Australia Council, partner and Melbourne office head at SEC Newgate, who will be our facilitator for today's panel discussion and will introduce us to our wonderful panel. Thanks, Faye. Thanks, Georgie. And I hope everyone can hear me, and um, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. Can I kick off also by um, paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today here in Melbourne, um, the Bunurong Boon Wadurung people and the Wurundjeri Woi Wadurung, and pay my respects to their traditional um, leaders, past, present, and some of the most gorgeous people I've met lately emerging. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a number of weeks now. Uh, this conversation, I think, in a national sense, has never been more timely. And the quality of the contributors to the chat we're going to have over the next 60 minutes are so impressive. At the end of that general chat here on the stage, we're also then going to open the um, mics to people to ask questions. So please, there'll be a couple of mics roaming on the floor. But also, for those who are um, joining us online, there, you can ask questions via the platform that you're watching the streaming on. So please figure out how the technology works now because there will be no home-based IT support. Um, the critical overarching question that we're going to be discussing really is what would it take to ensure that the Australian, that all Australians are living a fully contributing life, not just surviving but thriving? Words I, unbel I believe were actually coined <laughs> by you, Rachel. <laughs> which is very impressive. So let me start by introducing our panellists today. Um, immediately to my left is Rachel Green, who is CEO of SANE Australia, a national organisation 
supporting all Australians affected by complex mental health issues and working to end stigma, discrimination, exclusion and inequality. In her other guise, she's also been known as a painter, a punk folk musician, a mum to three young children, including a budding installation artist who specialises in mediums of permanent marker on Giprock. Next to Rachel on the screen, we have joining us today adjunct professor Janine Muhammad. Janine is a proud Noorong Kora woman from South Australia. She is currently the CEO of the Luicha Institute and a board member of the Libjira Theatre Company. Janine is passionate about cultural safety, the cultural and environmental determinants of health and karaoke. She is a retired sequin sewing stage mum of five children and three chickens, and in her spare time, she hides so that no one can find her. <laughs> <laughs> Next sitting, joining us on the stage is Professor Jill Bennett. Jill is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow at the Uni University of New South Wales, founding director of the Big Anxiety Festival, which every time I mention that, people say, I wish I did that. <laughs> and the Big Anxiety Research Centre. And there on our final screen, coming into us from Sydney, is Jeremy Thorpe. Jeremy is the chief economist of PwC Australia. He serves on the board of mental health organisation Flourish Australia and was previously chair of the copyright collection organisation for visual artists, Viscopy. So if you could please join me in welcoming our panellists. <laughs> We've got a lot of really interesting terrain to cover today. So I'd like to um, just map it out for you guys. We're first going to talk a little bit about the things that we know work. We're not going to dwell on the things that are the problems, because there's enough people who want to talk about problems. We're going to talk, and I really dig under things that work, we know work, are proven. And then we're going to talk, spend some time talking about how do you scale those things up? How do you take them from those incredible pilots, which are so exciting and successful, and deploy the learnings more effectively nationally? And finally, we're then going to have a bit of chat about what does that mean for policy development? What is the next steps in that space? So, kicking off with the first question, can I ask you, Janine, what do, you, what do we know? What are the positive examples from your experience and participation in arts and culture? Mm, sure. Thanks, Bart. I'm just getting a little bit of feedback on my voice, so if I'm, I'm not uh, talking succinctly and quickly, it's just because I can hear myself and I'm sure everyone's gone through that experience. Um, but of course, I must begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, whose traditional lands I get to live and work, and um, to pay my respects also to Elders past, present and future emerging generations for whom our work today is so important. Um, I can say that in Aboriginal affairs, I've been asked many times what the silver bullet is and what will fix the problems. And so I do enjoy talking about uh, what works. And I can honestly say there's no one solution, but there are many programs that absolutely make a difference. Um, and like everyone here, um, the arts, music, dance, visual arts all play a really huge role in, in my own personal wellbeing. And I realised that more than ever during COVID. Um, that also meant for me um, was that I had time to reflect into historical truth telling. And I do have to touch on what doesn't work. And that's when I think about our peoples being, you know, herded onto missions, um, you know, not being able to practice storytelling, dances, song, and artwork. That did nothing for our social and emotional wellbeing. So that's the opposite of what we should be doing, um, that suppression. Um, and we weren't, uh, you know, my growing up, I, I didn't see myself in the art scene. Um, there weren't people of my colour, you know, on the TV screens or on stage. Um, so that is also extremely important that my, my culture is reflected back to me. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that's probably the premise from where I start, which is, that um, yeah, our representation does work and it does add to our social emotional wellbeing. Um, and you know, I, I suppose my identity is my Teflon and being able to feel belonging and be my authentic self without judgment. Um, and one of those parts of my identity is that I'm a child of an ancient culture, uh, the oldest living culture. 
And, um, you know, there are so many parts of my life that have reinforced my identity, my culture and strengthened my wellbeing. So I'm, I'm one of the lucky people in my community um, to be able to be, um, you know, have that Teflon coating of culture. Um, and that connection uh, is also a big part of my work at Lowitch Institute, uh, where we've done lots of work on a term called the cultural determinants of health. Um, I can't go into all of the domains, but there's six of them um, that make up the cultural determinants of health. Uh, but one domain that's very important to our discussion today is cultural expression and continuity, the power of art, music and dance in our deep connection to country and our spiritual connection um, that these practices of the arts actually honour. When you think about you know, our arts, it's always paying homage to the legacy that's come before us and it's a, a part of uh, our continuation of culture. Um, so they're an essential part of our identity. Um, and what we've found is that cult is a protective factor. So we already knew it as Aboriginal people, but we had to do the research and the evidence um, to, to demonstrate that culture is a protective uh, part of our health and wellbeing. And it needs to be integrated and valued within uh, health policy frameworks and programs, as well as the arts. Um, so the work has mainly been done by an Indigenous researcher, Dr Ray Lovett. Um, one of his centrepieces of his work was that he found people who lived on co uh, country and were strong in culture um, usually have better health outcomes. Um, and I'll, I'll end on a, a really beautiful example that we highlighted of what works um, and it underpin, is underpinned by the cultural determinants and it's in our Close the Gap 2020 report um, and that report is titled We Nurture Our Culture, Our Future and Our Culture Nurtures Us um, and it's the case study or the story of the Nunaron uh, group. So they're a group of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander artists um, and they're or, or emerging artists living with a disability. Um, and each artist has their own powerful story that they share in um, artworks. And in those artworks, they map their journey uh, of struggle as well. And also their journey of healing through connections, through community, through culture and country. Um, and the convener of this group is called Uncle Paul Constable Colcutt. Um, and he's talked about what he's seen, um, you know, in the into the mental mental health services about the powerful impact um, that they've seen from members being able to spend time with elders, develop uh, you know friendships while they're there, and sharing their stories through art. Um, and one of the members said to th said to him, um, and I've got it written down here. He said, I don't really need to see a psychologist anymore uh, because sitting down with my elders makes my spirit heal. Um, so I think that's a really beautiful testimony, you know, of just one thing that has worked. Um, and there's many other examples um, and, uh, that all speak to improved health outcome and wellbeing through the arts and culture. But I will say that any policy development um, needs to include the cultural determinants. Thanks, Janine. Um, actually, the, the point about the community and connection to culture, connection to community. Rachel, from your experience, what have you seen that works when that works well? Thanks, Faye. Um, and I guess firstly, just acknowledge uh, and also pay my respects to elders past and present of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I mean, you know, I really I'm going to pick up on uh, so much of what Janine just covered, but uh, without wanting to state the obvious, art works and the arts and the arts broadly, and that means different things to different people, but right across painting, installation, sculpture, music, media, film, TV, um, the practice of it, the learning of it, shapes the development of young people and children and it is a way to connect with other people but also a way to build identity and build really important skills for the future. I mean, I don't think we reflect enough on the fact that um, young kids being taught to play an instrument, taught to paint, uh, really shapes thinking skills that appear later in life in a whole lot of different places. Um, the development of analytical capability but also the development of an ability to process events and make meaning from them and place them within a sense of identity. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think right across, uh, again, everything that, that Janine was saying, there's so much we can actually learn from social and emotional well-being frameworks if we want to look for a place to start. But, you know, art, art works to support mental health and well-being across, you know, the, the shaping of identity, the building of connection, the representation of people who are marginalised 
in society the processing of and recovery from trauma. And that's, you know, that's a big issue for us uh, right now in 2022, looking at what's just happened uh, in, in the flood affected regions and not forgetting those still in the fire affected regions where the impacts of that continue to be felt. Uh, you know, people are painting, people mm. are writing poems, people mm. are coming together. Um, and, and really, you know, something that's core to saying and our goals of ending stigma and discrimination within the decade, art and, art and the arts and the media is really uniquely able to challenge the way that people think about people who live with mental health issues and complex mental health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a, a, you know, a strategic planning process last year and there was a, a facilitator who said, come to the next session with a picture of the future when everything's better, what will it look like? And I had a picture of uh, home and away because when you see people with complex mental health issues represented in that forum, not as the storyline, but as a side issue, uh, people feeling represented, and that, that spans right across you know, all aspects of diversity and inclusion that's when we'll know that society has changed and art and the arts are uniquely able to do that, change the way people think and ultimately change the culture. So I would say, firstly, art and the arts work and in so many powerful ways, I think there's a um, huge opportunity to actually really recognise that, support it, develop it and, and often I think, you know, and we'll come to this a bit later in terms of what guidance would we be giving policymakers? But often these things happen a bit of a byproduct to um, a contract or a program or a funding objective. Uh, and one of the things we do poorly that we could try and improve is being open to the possibility of other positive effects through an activity and finding ways of mapping and, and capturing and tracking those successes. Because too often a project might have really important local impact, mm. but it's not what we're necessar necessarily studying and measuring for. So. We could think about how we open our minds to the role of, of the arts uh, within health and wellbeing um, activities and broader social activities and trying to track those impacts. Fascinating. Jill, you were nodding vigorously Yeah, well, as a researcher. <laughs> I, uh, of course, would endorse all, all of those previous comments. Um, I think art, it works, has tremendous potential, but maybe what we need to think about is how we harness that potential, because it doesn't always work, right? And so it's not as simple as walking into a gallery or going to a theatre and you're going to feel better. You might actually feel excluded and worse. And so I think we, I say this coming from the arts, we, we need to think about what we need to do to create access points and to enable people to make use of creativity and the arts. So it's not business as usual, throw open the doors and include more people, it's how we can use our resources and our capacity uh, to do something more. So in terms of what art actually does, I mean, I think uh, Rachel's right and, and Janine's right, that. Um, it, you know, it, it essentially enables us to understand complex internal processes. So it's a way of understanding distress and trauma and a way of representing that distress um, so that we can look at it, make change, um, share experience, communicate it um, in a way that actually um, reinforces agency. So in, in that process, there can be psychosocial benefits. You know, it's a, it's a process analogous to a psychotherapeutic one, whereby we gain insight, but also agency and control. Uh, as it can also lead to change, personal change and social change. And that's a huge part of a mental health agenda. So I think it's about thinking about um, the broader national agenda and our health agenda and goals in terms of what cultural capacities can bring. That's a really interesting point, that notion that you take something that a lot of people, I think, who are streaming in today have always recognised that arts makes a positive contribution to people's wellbeing. However, how do you articulate that in a way that then can be input into programmatic solutions? Um, on the end there in our glass, we have um, Jeremy, who is an economist, and spends a lot of his time figuring out how you define intangibles. Jeremy, please share with us what you think is, if, if, based off what Jill has been telling us, but what you've seen that works, processes that have enabled that articulation. 
It's interesting. I think um, some of what we've been talking about is also trying to understand this through different lenses. And But before that, I might just start with one lens, which is I'm also coming from Indigenous lands on the land of the Gadigal people and acknowledge uh, Elders past, present and emerging. Um, some of this is the different lenses may be, for example, the issue of the, the role of the arts in uh, preventative or building resilience versus maybe the role in recovery, the role, the difference from a participatory versus a, uh, a, a more passive a taker of the arts. I think you get different lenses in those kinds of contexts. Um, and just to some examples, we tend to focus more on the measurement it would the end where we're thinking of this as a, maybe a recovery support because we may be more consciously doing that activity in a mental health context. Whereas many of the, the benefits that we might be thinking about from a, a, an exposure or a resilience building capacity at the beginning, um, with, with arts generally being done for other purposes and it's a, it's a spillover, it's a positive externality that's being captured by the, the members of the community. On the recovery side, it's probably fair to say it took a while to get some of that evidence, but there's good five-year studies out of the UK of the benefits of thinking about um, recovery and the role of the arts. And at Flourish, we've seen some work with Western Sydney University that's really showed the role that can be undertaken for thinking about um, participatory activities, because often mental health is a challenge of not having a social environment or not having the community context. And art can be done in a free way that extends beyond the individual to embrace a broader community and engage in a different type of way. So um, I think we can think of art as for art's sake and the benefits it generates, but I think we can think of art as a therapeutic issue as well and a recovery issue. And maybe we've got greater scope to really identify some of the benefits in that context. I just want to pick up on um, one of those lenses there that I think, you know, potentially there's, a, there's an economic lens here too. If we think about the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is in terms of investment um, in support and, you know, under the NDIS, psychosocial disability is a thing that's funded. It's one of the bigger hitters. It can be one of the m most expensive interventions that we put in place for someone. And it's built on an insurance model where the idea is it's basically a market system. People have choice and control and can choose their provider and choose to switch. And that should lead to people getting better support. But when you look at the um, position or the lens that people are coming from, often this is a fairly new scheme, people are coming from never having had access to that kind of choice and control before and, and often coming from a position in society where they felt excluded and marginalised. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've seen work in practice is the use of art as a tool for developing that sense of citizenship and identity to, to feel the power of being able to make um, choice and control uh, discussions. And that should lead to, you know, following a market-based um, process, uh, a, better, uh, a better response from, from providers and hopefully some increased efficiency as we work towards services delivering better. It's, it's a bow, I'm a long bow I'm trying to draw here, but the arts can really help with that, that position of identity and feeling like you have the right to choose what's available to you, which is such an important thing to unpack for people living with more complex mental health issues in particular. You're saying the arts can be used to reinforce people's sense of self and confidence. Yeah, really helping define self and, that, and the fact that I mean, we, you know, we run um, some arts-based programs through the DAC Centre, which is a gallery here in Melbourne, uh, and those aren't, those aren't art, some of them have a therapeutic um, component, but the exhibitions are actually about artistry and being an artist and exhibiting as an artist. The art isn't all about mental health. And just framing it that way, instead of being about mental health or about the disability and recognising that personhood, um, again, it's arts as a mechanism can be so powerful in that shaping of identity and, and the taking of power and the taking up space. So enabling people to participate. Participate, exercise choice and feel like they have the right to. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if, it's interesting, the NDIS's own training program for people who are working in the NDIS space um, that everyone has to do. One of those exact examples is uh, someone with disability, not necessarily mental, but health issues, but uh, using the power to choose to go and undertake art 
So that is that self-empowerment mm -hmm. that you're exactly talking about. Excellent. So if we're, if we're talking about some of the key characteristics here of, about have, accepting that there is a different lens mm -hmm. that arts gives you to assessing and expectation management and benefits articulation, if um, accepting that there is a role, a very practical role that arts plays in empowering people and making them feel confident to engage in this new social order that we like to think we're entering into rather than being left behind, mm -hmm. um, then how do we take that kind of knowledge and those understandings and upscale it? How do we take it from these great case studies and turn it into a programmatic thinking? Rachel? Uh, look, just a small question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think one of the most powerful things we can do is go local and Ooh. work at a regional level. And it, you know, any sort of policy um, change must look at all levels of the system. Uh, we must support people who are emerging and groups that are emerging, particularly when we get into the nitty gritty of grants and funding applications, not everyone has the capability to um, compete in the writing of those. But in terms of, if you wanna actually have change, uh, you've gotta look at each community and each population group because there's so much difference and variation and local people collaborating and coming together around what's needed in the community and how things connect is fundamental to addressing the need for systemic change. But what we must do if we want that to happen is actually resource that collaboration. Mm -hmm. Everybody everywhere is doing their job and it's very hard to start new activity within the scope of whatever it is you're doing day to day. One of the things we saw very powerfully uh, when I was at Black Dog Institute and we implemented Lifespan, which is a systems approach to suicide prevention, the thing that I think will be one of the most lasting change, changes out of that um, trial is actually that it funded communities to come together and it funded a coordinator to bring them together and develop a common purpose. And so in anywhere where you wanna do systemic change, I think work at all levels, go regional, but locally developed solutions are essential. So yeah. bottom up kind of approach. I, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I think being bottom up is the key, um, rather than going in with a solution. And we could think about that in terms of systemic change, because we're not really talking here about two sectors, mental health and the arts. We're talking about um, a different way of responding to lived experience and needs on the ground. So it may not be, it's, it's not the case that either the arts or the mental health sector has the answer. In fact, we have some systemic problems and you know, people within the mental health sector will say, we need to do more to be people-centered, to respond to lived experience. But you have a sector that hasn't traditionally done that, right? It's been traditionally quite top down. So in the arts, you have um, the capacity for more open-ended communication and engagement mm -hmm. that hasn't been systematized in, in quite the same way. And, and there's also a fear of being instrumentalized, you know, oh, we're just, you know, using our art, you know, to suit someone else's agenda. So there are different ways of, of working. But I think really if we look at a national level and, uh, and in the big picture in terms of the social, um, we need to rethink the way that we resource mental health as a whole of community issue and a cultural issue. And we need to think about the people who are telling us we haven't got it right. And so the first thing we need to do is to really listen and so we need to empower everybody to have the means to tell their story and to communicate really quite complex issues that, you know, aren't, aren't, there isn't a discourse for a lot of the time. We need to create frameworks for that. And then if we do listen, practices will change. So I think it's a, quite an exciting opportunity to, to rethink um, a, approaches to psychosocial health. What you're saying, though, comes with, you know, when you talk about resources, you can imagine that the political decision makers instantly, their shoulders will tense mm. and they're waiting for the ask. Jeremy, talk to us more about how the nature of the ask is shifting. Yeah, so the investment model is something that we've talked about a lot and we do in certain circumstances, and that is uh, maybe you have to spend early to save later. Um, now, 
politicians and bureaucrats and administrators generally understand that as a principle but it's a leap of faith and so it's an evidence battle to really give confidence that those returns are actually going to come and that's that's where we've faced some of those challenges now we've made leaps of faith in some contexts um, we tend to think this about this in a real health context and so we're seeing invest uh, for example invest in people having health delivered at home so we don't the costs uh, in a hospital context where the NDIS at least in part was an investment model around at least in part around a productivity story now we made a leap of faith and we've still got more to do to achieve that and it's the same thing here it, we really you need to be able to go to decision makers with what's the payback going to be for doing this um, whether people like it or not economics is still often the language of uh, administration um, and but we're seeing it in some context I'll give you an example of return to work environments where um, people that have maybe had trauma in a workplace uh, there are trials taking place already around how do we involve art programs to invest in those people and use that as a mechanism to support them in their journey back to work so we can do this but it does take an evidence base that we've often struggled to do and often um, it, it's complex because these are individuals in a non-monetized environment um, and trying to put a value on that so that you can say there's a benefit cost ratio that's greater than one so i mean and of course it goes without saying we all live in the 2020s and we know what wi-fi issues are so <laughs> i appreciate your understanding but um, both Jeremy and Janine have um, done a great job in soldiering on through technical challenges. The, you've hit on a, a key point there, though, um, Jeremy, in terms of this notion that outcomes-based investment. So outcomes is not the traditional way that either mental health or the arts is funded. It's always been an inputs comp discussion. Um, so, ha and you say part of that is developing the evidence. What are the things that allow you to develop the evidence? And actually, anybody on this stage has been involved in programs that have gone through these struggles, so I'm very keen to hear what um, people would say, have to I, say on this. I, I, look, I'll jump in. I think one of the things that, you know, um, it's a bugbear of mine, so excuse me if I go down a nerd um, rant here, but um, government procurement guidelines, let's talk about those. Um, I think that there's a real need for innovation in the way that we fund things. And the processes of awarding a tender might work really well for who's going to build the building. They don't work very well for helping support and develop community solutions that involve lots of different players and consultation. And I think it's one of the areas where governments of every level could look to do things in a different way. Uh, and it goes beyond um, frameworks, consultation and the usual approach. I think we actually need different types of funding and development pathways that will allow um, community or, or, or you know, sec joint sector-based work to happen and then propose things to be funded. And obviously, you know, we, we want our tax dollars to be spent efficiently and appropriately and we need processes to manage that. But it's like we're still managing the way that we invest in what we want for the country in a way that was really designed more for which contractor you know provides the security in parliament house and it's not necessarily appropriate for supporting the kind of change we need to see or the organizations that might be best placed to partner and do it and one of the thing one of the places to look for that is actually what's happening in philanthropy mm -hmm. where there is a big trend towards investing in core capacity for organizations i believe there was a report came out uh, yesterday that showed that you know um non-profits and charities are being sort of um, kept in perpetual starvation mode because grants often require them to only have 10% overheads. And I mean, if you've worked out how to do that, please tell me. Uh, and you know, so a lot of philanthropists and trusts and foundations are moving towards funding just core activity and allowing the flexibility of organisations with a strong vision and mission to apply that. Um, and some other of the of the bigger foundations I've seen, I know Paul Ramsey Foundation. Uh, particularly in their early days when they would look at funding a grantee they would also look at providing an additional amount that provided them with the kind of technical support or consultant support to really think about building and and in addition to that I would say would be working with implementation scientists a growing and really important field um, that you know could do so much to make sure that the things we then decide to do collectively 
uh, you know, are impactful and, and work and apply the evidence with fidelity. Excellent. Yeah. And also, I think we have to be much more imaginative in the way we think about evidence gathering, particularly when we're looking at bottom-up evidence from lived experience and, and communities. We don't necessarily have the measures for community growth that, that are relevant. And, and with the arts, you know, everybody knows it's very infuriating when you reduce something to an output and then look at the mechanism as if it's simple cause and effect. And what you do, if you go too quickly to the measure, is you miss what's really valuable in the process, because it's a process-based experience engaging with the arts. So those kind of frustrations is something that First Nations people have had to uh, deal with for decades now, Janine. It'd be interesting to get your perspective yeah. on what you've how you've overcome these kind of hurdles around evidence gathering and redefining the procurement processes to get that government engagement and support and access to the resources that you most definitely need. Well, I think for a long time it was actually a, a matter of trust, you know, trusting us as organisations to be able to, to manage money. And we've done lots of research over the years that show that we're probably more highly um, scrutinised than any other sector. Um, and so there's that inherent bias of us actually being awarded these funds. And then there's the ongoing issue of who's awarding the funds. They're not necessarily Indigenous peoples reading um, our procurement bids or tenders. Um, and I think the other thing that happens for us is, you know, that, and it happens for every sector, particularly the NGO sector, is that you're constantly chasing the money. It's, it's you know, subject to terms and conditions. So, you know, yeah, three years into a program and then you have to apply for that money again. Hmm you're getting the gains and the outcomes that you need and there's so many amazing programs that have been lost over the years that really mm -hmm. do work um, but we're subjected to the outcomes um, that are revered <laughs> by government not a, that are revered by our communities and just picking up on the discussion before I think you know the the um, structures and the systems that we also find ourselves in um, you know don't necessarily match our indigenous ways of knowing being and doing so we were talking about economy before and, you know, the currency of money. Um, but there's some amazing evidence internationally of, you know, um, in Bhutan and I think now New Zealand have picked up, you know, a gross uh, national happiness index. Mm. And wouldn't be, that be a much better currency <laughs> and ways of measuring us as a country than, than money? Mm. Um, so, yeah, they're my comments. Thanks, Pat. I'd love to, I'd love to yeah, jump please. in there um, and just... Uh, I guess support everything you've said. I mean, um, on two fronts, and, and one is that we, we, we can't discount and we must measure the value of joy. And if there's one thing that I think we've all experienced over the last couple of years, is just the, you know, COVID amongst everything else that's going on and the anxiety that comes with it and the threat of climate change is just that missing joy. Mm. It, it stopped us from going places and doing things and that lost joy of events and um, music and gathering together with people is, is such a missing piece that, you know, you, you have this opportunity occasionally but now that things are opening up to go and do it again and you really can feel that absence of what's, what's mm. been missing. But it's not a thing that we measure um, right now. Uh, and I guess the other point I was going to make is just around um, what we do measure and, and how much we miss using standardised or... or um, measurement that doesn't capture the additional benefits that might occur. Years ago, I was really fortunate to be able to visit some remote uh, Aboriginal communities in the West and in the top end where they were growing food as part of a very sort of um, naive student um, uh, project I was doing. And people were growing these amazing, like huge gardens and watermelon and eggplant and pumpkin. Uh, and they were funded through a scheme called CDEP, the Commonwealth uh, Development and Employment Program. And those things funded projects for a very specific purpose and with that funding they bought equipment and they bought equipment like irrigation and tractors and when the project ends those things go and the garden founders and the people are left feeling blamed for it not working and what's not measured is that while the garden exists they're distributing the food and they're eating the food and the kids are coming down and working with family and people are feeling pride and the, 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 the program had no way of measuring those things yeah. and so it missed them and it created a story that didn't account for what was actually happening in the community. 
we seem to be slipping as well into a conversation around um, the, the, the knowns, the unknowns, and actually defining the known knowns mm. better, so measuring mm. better, that point about evidence. You've been doing a lot of work, Jill, in this space in terms of trying to identify mm. and articulate what's coming out of um, these programs. And yeah, projects. I mean, I was just thinking when you were talking, uh, you know, we founded this uh, festival, the Big Anxiety Festival, and the, the idea of that was really to explore that middle ground of what, you, what happens when you can seed and continue projects, arts-driven projects and community-driven projects. I should say, um, we, we started off with this tagline, people plus art plus science. Mm. And, um, I mean, it was just a tagline at the start. But then I realised it's quite an important inversion of the hierarchy if you go people, art, science, well, you know, mm. sort of rather than being led by medical science, it's important. But what happens if we're actually led by what people are telling us and people's needs? So it's very um, ground up. But we were thinking about also what does the art world need to do if it's going to operate in this area? So it's very different than saying, you know, we'll have a show, a survey show or whatever, and the theme will be mental health. That, that's easy. But the problems with that is that you're, you know, beholden to this idea that the arts delivers something new, never repeats an idea, and then when it's done, it's done. So it's like the circus comes to town and goes away. And that's wholly inappropriate, obviously, for community building. So over time, you know, we've done a few of these in, in Sydney and some little things elsewhere. We're in Queensland at the moment and then Melbourne later in the year in October. And what we've noticed is, of course, we tried to raise money to do, to, to involve as many people as possible and therefore to have as many new projects as possible. But we also realised that we move along too quickly, you know, when, when projects work, and we've had fantastic projects, like you know, the project with Uti Kulinjaku in the APY lands, which is really one, uh, they have one of the most impressive mental health literacy and support programs you could imagine, developed in this bottom-up way, led by Nunkari, working with, um, uh, you know, health professionals as well. Um, you know, the, these are amazing projects, but what they need is traction and time to germinate. And so it's almost like you're working in this sort of iterative testing mode. And, and we've done some quite cool things with them, you know, making virtual reality versions of traditional stories led by them. And then they take them out to remote communities and see if they work. And if they don't work, we do something else. Um, but, you know, fantastic results just by letting things flow and grow and and then we think well actually we don't need to do something new let's bring those to queensland or to melbourne and and see what we can catalyze locally so it's a very different model that's not obsessed with um you know moving on and and change the whole time so much as embedding i'm very keen to get a sense from you then would you what would you say would be the policy framework you could look at that would help enable that kind of growth or upscaling? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we need a different kind of support in the arts. I mean, obviously, there's just too little support in the arts to do big projects. So we need, we need to work with other sectors, but it's very difficult to work with health. You know, I have brilliant partners and the most exciting thing is, is our projects have been picked up. Like we did a great project on suicide prevention that again was with, with community. We ended up building this immersive environment that supports future thinking and mood improvement in a form that people want to use. And then that was picked up by actually Metro South Health in Brisbane. So things can grow if, if you do them right. But it would have been really hard. We, we couldn't have got health funding from mm. the start for that. Yeah. You know, so we actually did it as a community project, art project, and then we get some measurement and evaluation around it. And then it's a health project. So this is what, uh, three years later, and it's growing and growing. And we're now trying to really upscale that as something that could be rolled out. But there's actually no funding structure. It's very piecemeal. Mm. And so we actually created the big anxiety so we could try to 
raise that kind of money. But of course, what we've noticed is in all areas, funding is very siloed. Everyone thinks it's a brilliant idea and yeah. they want to support it. But then when it comes to it, they say, oh, it's not quite medical and it's not quite arts, right? Yeah. All and, and as for research funding, it's a shocker because it's completely segregated. We don't have imaginative investment in health translation as, as they mm. do in, in certain places like Canada. We can do more imaginative work. So there's just not that trust in the arts sector. What we need is a fund that seriously understands the contribution of arts and culture to well-being and, and funds us to do what, what we can do really well. So, Jeremy, you're yeah. vigorously not in <laughs> So, it, there's a couple of things here. Uh, one is the move of some states and in New Zealand to what's called outcome-based budgeting, I think is a really positive uh, step forward here, which says what's government trying to achieve? It's trying to achieve better outcomes for people. And we need to think about outcomes when we think about departmental budgets. And so that goes to that point about silos, that we're, we're really uh, traditionally thought of health as health, art as art, transport as transport. We need to view that maybe the mental, well, mental health well-being of our community is an outcome that we need to achieve and actually think of funding and alignment across departments to achieve that. Now, that's happening slowly. Uh, I'm not saying it's the answer today, but there, there's, a, there's a direction at least of understanding that. The issue of engagement, I think, is a really interesting one, and one bit that maybe gets left out of that is just to ensure that this isn't, and I'm not saying this is what's been suggested, that it isn't the arts community um, serving to the mental health community. And the issue here is of peer engagement. In other words, people with lived experiences being as part of that answer. Um, and so organisations, arts organisations, um, thinking about engagement of people with lived experiences and how that can be uh, used to better deliver services, or maybe that maybe sounds too strong, but to, pro to do what is already being done, but in a way that is more likely to maximise those benefits for people on a mental health journey. I might just jump in there. I think, um, yeah, just building off the discussion so far, it's almost like we need um, regional art and wellbeing budgets that communities can come together to determine uh, you know, what's needed and the way to spend that money. But the, the, the key structural piece for that to be enabled would be uh, funding the development of the partnerships to bring that together. And we have a precedent for this. So in the health sector, primary health networks are the, the Commonwealth government's arm of, of spending its money. And then at the state level, you get a state version of a local hospital, a local health district. And even those structures have been in place for some time and are still working out how to work together uh, and even with the sort of third wheel of the community NGO sector and then the lived experience sector. And so you, you actually have to invest in the coordinating elements, in the people to bring that together, to facilitate the conversations, to build the relationships uh, before you could then fund um, arts budgets over the top. So I think that definitely regionally focused um, investment could work if those structural underpinnings are there. But also just um, you know, picking up on the two points about, you know, if we think about science, one of the things that um, is often sort of talked about as being the thing we don't do enough of and, and should really do more of, which is just fund replication of things um, and yeah. be open to funding yeah. things and having them not work so we can learn and then do the thing that does work. This is it's often less appetite for that, testing something that's been done somewhere else and saying, does it work here? Being open to it not working, but learning what else might work. And lastly, fund artists. I mean, I feel like this is the, the thing I've got to say as a, you know, artists and musicians in the family, but the, particularly at the, at the um, lower levels and the emerging level, the impact of the last couple of years and the loss of gigs uh, and the loss of events has been so profound. So they're already keen on this. This yes. is already something they're thinking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, making it part of KPIs and things and supporting them to network locally and, and put up and support projects that will not only support their mental health by returning to work, but their mental health in, in bringing the community together and putting on those experiences that create joy for the rest of us and for the wider community. We must not forget to fund artists and musicians and those people in the community doing that work.
I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room and online that are nodding vigorously. <laughs> and you say it gives us a perfect time to open the mics for questions. So as I said earlier, there's going to be a couple of people, if you want to ask a question in the room, please just put your hand up. You're probably doing another 50 people a favour who would like that exact same question asked. Uh, and if you're calling in or watching online, please just use the platform you're watching from. There'll be a text box that you can clearly ask your questions through. And they're going to be fed through to me in a way that ensures that technology will fail us. Um, <laughs> but we'll do our best together. The, um, while we're waiting for those to come through, I've got a couple here already. There we go. People are so quick. So because people have had the opportunity to be asked questions as we go, okay, so some of these things will jump us back in the conversation, but we can all deal with that because we are all agile and responsive. <laughs> um, what do people who identify as having mental health issues or mental illness want in terms of treatment and response? How do they feel about this topic? I mean, when you said before, it's, it's the ground up, you listen to people, but what are they saying that you hear most commonly? I'm going to put that one to you, Jill. Yeah, I mean, often people come to us with a sense that they're not being listened to and maybe haven't got um, a satisfactory response from you know, avenues to clinical support, or maybe they have, but, you know, people live with lifelong trauma. Maybe you get, you know, 10 sessions of really brilliant therapy per year, but it's not enough. What about all of the rest of the year? Mm. And so in terms of building resilience and the kind of internal structures that we need to negotiate everyday reality, um, we, we need the, this, this more embedded um, sort of learning and processing that we can achieve, I think, through cultural means. And so always, I think, um, it's a question of listening. I mean, we, we don't know un until we listen. It's about creating a space where people can articulate what's happening for them and work towards a solution. Of course, they, they don't come saying, um, you know, I know exactly what I want, but part of the facilitation might be to think through what, what can be achieved. And so it's a slow processing. And the one thing I would say about the time frames as well is that, um, you know, if we, if we construct properly trauma-informed programs, they work. Often we will have spectacular successes if we take the time and do things mm. properly. But they may be spectacular for, you know, five people in a small group because we've invested a, a lot of time and, and resources. And that's what makes it difficult to, to scale up, that, yeah. that you, it, we can't always compromise um, the time. So I think finding ways to give people access at multiple levels to processes that work is, is really critical. I might jump in if that's okay. Yes, please. I think, um, you know, the, the notion of equity, which is not treating everyone the same um, and giving everyone the same, but actually um, acknowledging that people come from different places and meeting people where they're at, mm. uh, and that's true equity. And so that, that agency, I think, that the whole panel has been speaking about is really fundamental, um, and it's already just been mentioned about uh, people having choices. Um, and I think I mentioned some of the really important terms before, for, uh, and I speak on behalf of you know, myself, not on behalf of the whole of Indigenous Australia, because I can't do that, but it's just in what, you know, my response come from, uh, comes from a place of working in research and um, being a, a health professional myself. Um, that, and I'll, I'll rift off of what was said before, that they want access. So you can have a hospital or you can have a local health network um, that receives government funding. But if you're 3% of the population <laughs> um, and it's the other 97% that have told you what needs to be in the policy or the service delivery is geared towards them, then that's really hard to get um, you know, trauma-informed, culturally safe care. So it's not just access of the physical building, but it's access to elevated voices and services that um, are made for, by, and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and probably, you know, what you had read out before, one of my passions is cultural safety. And so just to spend a little time, a bit of time, 
you know, explaining what that is, that's not learning about Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples where that's very comfortable and almost cultural voyeurism. Um, cultural safety is actually turning the lens onto ourselves um, and understanding our own biases, beliefs, uh, historical truth telling, you know, thinking about who made systems and who the system benefits, um, and really taking that knowledge, critically analysing it, thinking about what your individual agency can be to change race relations in Australia and change systems. That's actually um, fascinating, Janine, because it plays on the next question that I had um, shared here, a question by Felicity Chapman from Deadly Weavers. Felicity asks, how do we ensure that any policy documents embeds Indigenous cultural intellectual property protection and assures that First Nations artists can lead and implement our cultural expression into SEWB programs? And how are we protected from black cladding? My new mm. favourite phrase. Do you want me to have a go at that one? I think, <laughs> if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So at Lowich Institute, you know, we actually fund research. So the first thing that we do to ensure that intellectual property is maintained for the people that we give research dollars to is we put it in the contract. Um, so that's not just individual intellectual property, but community intellectual property. So that's intellectual property that you know people have had for um, millennia. Um, so I think that's one really you know, fundamental thing that we can do to actually, um, you know, ring fence um, Indigenous uh, intellectual property for community. And I think he asked, the, the other one was about uh, cultural determinants, I believe, Faye, and yes. please tell me if I don't answer this right. Um, but we put it in, you know, national documents that basically says culture has to be at the centre of whatever, um, you know, we do. What the problem has been, I think, is that the people making these policies are non-Indigenous peoples. So they actually have to understand and value culture um, to ensure that the policies that they make um, benefit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And that means us being at the table and being in those positions of power. And when we're not, because we are 3% of the population, that we have non-Indigenous allies that really understand this stuff, sitting there, you know, um, opening those doors and allowing us to access uh, that power and, and elevating our voices. I hope that helps. Very much so. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got a question from Tim Butcher from University of Tasmania. Uh, Rachel, he references something you mentioned, that the local projects may not be what, are being me what have been measured. So how might we have a more joined up approach to connect various local projects to share learnings and demonstrate meaningful outcomes? That's a great question. Uh, and I think it's one people think about and talk about um, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I think there's this sort of fairly well um, uh, known tra uh, gaps between knowledge translation. We can measure something and find out that it works on a particular problem. And it's something like 17 years before that evidence makes its way to any sort of scale or, or delivery. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have a great answer here, but I think that Networking and collaboration is really valuable and one of the biggest uh, gaps in, you know, if I just think about mental health, uh, you know, are the gaps between even, you know, our, our parts of our sector that are all working on mental health, mm. big gaps. Gaps between us and alcohol and drug, gaps between us and housing, gaps between us and employment. And so if we expand that out to sort of the broader community spectrum, it's, it's a need to bridge those gaps that's really, really critical. And it's saying, you know, that's a thing that we're really focusing on in our communities and platforms and services that we're developing, are designing specifically to work and provide community to people at an individual level and connect out and stay with people as they try and interact with those different systems. Uh, but I think that um, any time we're looking at, you know, coming back to what, you know, what we're here for today, which is what could government try and do next, I think when you when you, what get me, gets measured gets done. And I was just thinking, um, uh, listening on to the answer, answers on the previous question about how, I think there's a, there's a, there's a well-known example of when they started measuring hand washing rates in hospitals and then publicly reporting it, hand washing went up. Mm. Um, what gets measured gets done. And so if you want to protect um, uh, IP, cultural IP, if you want to make sure that organisations are not just paying lip service to um, in inclusion and cultural safety, you've, there's got to be mechanisms that track that, that people have to report on without creating a burden that has us reporting all the time mm. and not doing the work, but what gets measured gets done. And so there's ways of building that accountability in, I think, and there's ways of actually supporting and fostering 
the kind of collaboration that would help us to share knowledge about what's happening where and how it's working. And some of that's got to be between the different sectors that don't typically work together. And you know, in terms of what we're talking about here today, between the sectors of the arts, and they are plural, and the health and wellbeing sectors. So again, I'm going to come back to the local level, but also structurally, you know, within, within government and policy spaces, there's more that could happen um, to bring those together. And it, it's a bit cheeky of me to say, but when I worked in the public service, I remember there was a point we were working uh, in the Office of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health on a, uh, I think it was a policy position around, um, uh, it might have been community health or men, and I asked about the Office of Indigenous Policy Coordination, and people weren't really quite familiar with it. And I'm like, no, it's, I know it exists. My mum worked there. Um, it, I think its job is to coordinate <laughs> between us different departments. And, you know, famously, there's a big bureaucracy, so how do we get um, just people within the bureaucracies, I'm getting in a lot of trouble here, um, knowing what else is out there, but also knowing what everyone else is working on. Um, and you know what's a great way of doing that? Getting people in a room to connect and engage. I can't tell you about the number of times when we were working on the suicide prevention programs where we'd just come to a collaborative meeting and around the biscuits and the tea, people would be introducing themselves. Oh, I work in this space, I work in housing. Oh, it's great to meet you. I work in drug and alcohol, let's swap cards. So, uh, you know, let's all adopt a, adopt a bureaucrat and invite them to a fun event where there's a <laughs> bit of joy and uh, maybe we're gonna connect and share ideas. You laugh, you laugh, but I once did a strategic comms review for a major federal department and they had 17 key stakeholders, 16 of which were other departments. Mm. And the 17th was called the Australian people. <laughs> so it does, does tell you their focus is sometimes a little bit more introverted mm. and even not that particularly successfully. Um, we've got a great question here from uh, Lee Francis. <laughs> it's quite simple. Why does the NDIS make it so hard to fund arts activities? Can we change their mindset about this? Who wants to take that one? Can I, can I jump in here and maybe just also reflecting on the other question previously? And we've already mentioned the issue of procurement. And I think there is an issue here, and I'm not specifically thinking of the NDIS, but the issue of you want to both encourage innovation. In other words, you want people a thousand flowers bloom and you want to see new ideas emerge. Um, but there's a role for government, whether that be from an arts perspective or a health perspective or a disability perspective, to almost curate some markets as well. In other words, I think there's a, there is an information sharing exercise of, we've seen this work over here. How and we want to tell people so it can also be used over here. And to the, that central purchasing power is a, is a really important transmission mechanism for learning. But it's always not stifling new ideas that have never been seen anywhere else. Um, and so getting, getting organisations to view their role, I think, in developing markets that are going to be more effective or developing suppliers or activities that are going to be more effective, to me is a real central role that maybe sometimes gets overlooked for we're buying X. Mm. What we're trying to do is buy an outcome mm. and helping people further get to that outcome uh, is, I think, that role of government. I think we've got a, somebody in the front row who has a question. Yes, thank you. And thank you uh, to the panel for a great session. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about creative recovery and resilience building in relation to arts and wellbeing. And just to see if the panel had any comments about, given the increasing frequency, intensity and impact of natural disasters and also now of COVID, um, how arts and wellbeing space will relate to that or how the panel sees that happening moving forward. I'd like to take that one. Yeah, uh, there's lots to say. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a very opportune time to respond and increase investment. We've, we've got a project unfolding in Queensland at the moment that's quite interesting because it, um, well, it's part of the Big Anxiety Queensland. We're doing this thing called the Big, big Reach and it got so named because um, we started off working with health department in Brisbane and then, um, you know, Darling Downs health people were saying, yeah, we've got these problems out here, what are you going to do about this? And how, you know, can you come to our town? And then the next town would say, well, what's the point in just doing it there? How do we, how do we develop a model? So, so what we're doing, of course, you know, we don't have an answer, but 
we moved out to some of those small towns and started doing what we do on the ground, which is, in, in a sense, to be responsive. We have some quite open protocols around being trauma-informed and led by sort of needs expressed on the ground and just creating some support structures and then bringing in expertise, which could be, um, in this case, in, in media arts and theater, um, different kind of participatory arts. So you, you, you bring those in, but uh, applying those protocols and, and then respond to um, needs on the ground. And it has to be then a collaborative um, build. But the, the other thing that's happening, of course, is you know we're, we're planning this um, larger event in Brisbane in May, and artists are calling up saying, uh, you know, I, I can't do the presentation I was going to do because I, you know, have a recurrence of my own PTSD and I'm completely shattered and in pieces. Mm. And so, of course, what we need to do is to just roll with that because actually people need to hear you talking from that space. They don't need your rah-rah kind of happy um, piece. And... Um, and so an artist said to me the other day, it's so good to hear that. I thought I wasn't going to be able to, you know, muster that energy. But it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. We, we have to expand and hold the moment. And that's, um, you know, it's inconvenient. We, we, things won't run to schedule. And with COVID, people are dropping out and, and will continue to do so. So... I think it goes back to our original point about it's not bouncing back and suddenly the art world, it, of course it will rejuvenate, but n not necessarily the same. We've learned a lot of lessons and we've learned to be more agile and adaptive. And so maybe we don't necessarily shut down for two months if there is a massive disaster. We can be frontline workers. In fact, you know what mo motivated me when we founded the, the Big Anxiety? There'd just been a Sydney Biennale. This, you know, obviously this won't go any further, but the, the curator had been then, way back, had been interviewed. And she'd said, oh, you know, artists are kidding themselves if they think they're like human rights workers. We can comment on issues, but we're not the equivalent of people on the front lines doing the real work. And, yeah, you know, obviously it's sometimes true if you, if you don't choose to be, but I'm thinking... Well, really, actually, we can work on serious trauma. We can work on suicide. We don't have to do just the easy, you know, like catering to the worried world, the, the simpler end of mental health. So we absolutely, you know, we have the cultural resources mm. and there isn't enough in communities now. So we should be in Lismore, Northern Rivers and, and these areas. And, and we are. I mean, the plenty of colleagues are, and I think we just need to be a bit bolder, and hopefully the funding will, will support that. Excellent, thank you. I'll, I'll, I've just had a comment to make just off the back of that. I think, I think you know, in addition to those things, it, it's important to be proactive as well as reactive. Um, we ran some programs, I think in 2020 through SANE, that worked with local artists um, to, to support them in a model that then delivered arts and mental health combined projects within the community, and they were really successful. Um, we need to be thinking about doing that at scale, so there's capability within the community ahead of these events happening, mm -hmm. but I think that's got to be balanced with, you know, the practical um, recovery and, and preparation and, and mitigation, frankly, mm -hmm. that is needed. I mean, there was a... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, some news articles earlier in the year about a community in the mountains that needed water trucks and through a grants round got dancing. And <laughs> it, it, pits, it pits art and practical stuff against each other and they shouldn't be. We, th you know, there's value in both, mm. uh, but it's got to be community-led and community-designed because where, where arts and, you know, that, that sort of activity-based stuff is really powerful is that for people who've experienced a significant trauma, um, going into something that's very sort of structured and um, wanting you to kind of talk about and document or, or even participate in therapy, it it's actually, can actually be too much. So just literally spaces and places to be mm. and um, things to take your mind off what's happening can be really practical. And I know, you know, for people with um, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, some, some sort of presentations of more complex mental health issues, often being able to distract yourself from what's going on can be really powerful in the moment for managing how things are impacting you. So um, places, spaces, uh, and you know, if we think right into sort of game, gamified uh, learning and mental health therapies, there's, a, there's enormous uh, potential there, but we've got to be thinking about putting those structures in place ahead of um, the kinds of things that, that then might, might cause or create trauma. We're great at crisis, not so great at prevention. Yes. We've got, a, I believe, somebody in the audience who's got a question. Yes, hi. Um, my name's Belinda. I'm here as part of my role as Chair of Arts Access Australia. Um, I'm one of those people who you've been talking about who lives with complex mental health conditions. Um, and we've been hearing a lot about the importance of lived experience and representation today. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, how many of you work for organisations that are disability-led at the CEO and board level? I'll, I'll jump in there if I can. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is something that is, is really fundamental to our organisation. So uh, we're really proud to have lived experience uh, right through our board, including designated roles, and lived experience at every level of the organisation, uh, including myself with my own um, experience of uh, ADHD, generalised anxiety disorder, and a you know, a fairly substantive history of suicidality when I was younger. What I really try and do when I share that, though, is also say I now have quite a lot of social capital to be able to manage that. And so our purpose as an organisation is actually making that not only an embedded principle in what we do, but, but our purpose, in fact, is about working with people who have the greatest need and supporting them to build their voice and achieve everything that they can. And I, coming back to there was a question that came in online, I think, about what do we hear from people what do they want We're from people who have a lived experience? And it, 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 I, you know, I, I wanted to jump in on that because it's see me as a person. The impact of stigma and discrimination and people not being able to disclose in the workplace, I can do it, I'm the CEO. I've reached a point where I, you know, I'm fairly comfortable of my position. That doesn't necessarily apply to someone who's um, new in their retail job at Woolies. Mm. Uh, and again, representation matters. It matters because it shows us that people are more than what's happening to them, people are more than the way that they're perceived, and they are definitely more than the stereotypes uh, that exist in the community. So in answer to the, the actual question, me here very proudly um, lived experience led at every level. Great, thank you. And yeah. I'm not actually going to require so, people to do an audit test, oh. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's, it's up to individuals if they want to disclose their own and their organisations. Um, I think I, it's probably you know, pretty obvious from Lowich's perspective, we're an Aboriginal community controlled organisation. So our board is made up of only Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, many of you in the audience would know uh, the, um, the statistics for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples with, uh, in terms of mental health, um, in terms of suicide, um, in, in terms of our interaction with the judicial system, um, which of course comes with its own um, poor mental health and social emotional wellbeing outcomes. So I think I'm safe to say that, yes, our board would be made up of people who have lived experience. And sadly, um, many of us uh, have very close experience um, to members who have suicided. Um, you know, in just in a small country town in Western Australia, we have the highest suicide rates in the world of children um, under the age of 13. Um, and just to disclose, CEO of the organisation and, you know, um, had a very close uh, family member who's now a survivor of suicide at the end of last year. So as an organisation, it, um, you know, being able to hear those voices um, and being able to um, also have policies and procedures that support our organisation and the, our beautiful team members, because we're 60% employed Aboriginal people as well, um, is really important to us. Um, as I said before, we fund Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health research and 100% of our money goes to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander researchers. So um, in terms of an organisation empowering our people, um, we trust them and we live by it. So yeah, that's us. Oh. I'll be brief. I mean, just again, 54% of Flourish's staff have a lived experience. I think almost everyone on the board either would be uh, someone with a lived experience or a carer uh, or have a close family member as well. I think it's kind of core to our organisation as, a, as 
uh, true understanding and support, in our view, comes from uh, people being able to talk and engage with people with similar experiences. I think there's a question here, though, that, that might be interesting for, for the coming back to the, the purpose of this session about what works and what can we feed into policy. And that's that in the, in the mental health sector, we, we're really well versed in nothing about us without us, which is a principle where we, you know, co design is fundamental to doing good work because who better to know how to make the system better than the people who have to use it all the time? But I'm, I'm curious actually about um, how, you know, how that will work. Uh, you know, in, in an art setting, is that, a, and I'm not sure if that's a principle that is that is applied equally. But that might be one of the points of of discussion if we try and actually foster greater sector collaboration. I don't know who I'm asking that to, but um. it's probably a, no, it's it's probably just, because the system has failed us too. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's it's come out of adversity, unfortunately, that um, we've learnt these lessons. Mm. Perhaps it's a perhaps it's a policy question then. Uh, uh, to how to shape this initiative, uh, how, could we, how could we share that, nothing about us without us principle with the artists and see what they mm. have to say about how to do this better? Very good point. And um, to give people a sense of the, the pathway for development of this, there is two series of workshops happening um, over the next few months in a more closed environment to literally work through how these mm. things could be evolved. Um, mm. So that's something that's definitely going to... I saw people frantically reinforcing their notes on the side there. So, um, yeah. the so I was just going to say, I, I mean, I obviously come from a university, so that yeah. presents its own challenges. You know, mm. very good in terms of mental health research establishment and, and arts research, but, um, yeah, the bringing together of those silos and genuinely honouring lived experience is... It's a work in progress, to say the least. And I think what, what we're doing is opening up spaces where that can happen. But, but to your point about where, where does policy go around this, I think there's, there's a huge amount of work to do with capacity building. Mm. So it's not um, you know, create, just create opportunities for artists to work in mental health and vice versa. It's, it's building its own expertise in, in the way that, say, peer support has been developed as a, a sector that has its now uh, own expertise. I think this area of arts applications needs, you know, considerable development, study, and capacity building. Jill or, uh, uh, Jill or Rachel, I think you said it before. It's about creating the right environments as well. Mm. So you can put it into the system, but the environment might not be right. I'll, mm. I'll just share quickly um, that I did a piece of work working with the nursing and midwifery leadership where um, our members told us they wanted cultural safety um, as an antidote to racism to be embedded into the system. So um, what it resulted in was we put cultural safety into nursing and midwifery codes of conduct, into education, and then into the accreditation standards of hospitals. But what I had to do at the start was really walk the nursing and midwifery workforce through definitions and a shared understanding of what cultural safety actually was. Mm -hmm. So that then when we went out to, you know, to the masses to do our lobbying, um, we were all on the same page. And of course, I couldn't be everywhere. So our allies actually had to do that shared understanding and stepping into their responsibility. But we did have media backlash. <laughs> you know, through that, that campaign and trying to embed that policy. Um, and that's when the rubber really hit the road in the relationship um, and that, you know, you've both been talking about the, that collaborative sector really needs to have their own capability and capacity building as well so that people can go forth on the same page. hope that helps. Unfortunately, we're going to have to drill to close this... Uh Fascinating conversation. Um, I'm going to hand over to Georgie McLeanigan from um, the Australia Council in just a minute, but I just wanted to just point out that um, I think we covered a lot of ground very successfully today, and um, I'd like um, to just, if I can, share my observations. The fundamental role of communication, be it, you know, creating channels as well as spaces and common understanding around definitions before you can move forward is something that it clearly needs uh, focused attention. 
and also the, the evidence gathering to gain that trust, are we measuring the right things? Mm. They seem to me to be two streams of work that can build. Mm. Mm. So um, George is going to ask people to thank the panel. Yes, indeed, so I, don't I will. So I don't that, but thank you from me. Thank you. Thanks, Fee. And I've got the job of wrapping up, and unfortunately that is all we have time for today. I'm one of those people who have been furiously taking notes off to the side, thinking about how we support agency in these conversations and how we get creative about the ways we partner, how we fund, how we measure impact, and how we kind of work in this space because obviously mental health and well-being requires an understanding of the whole person the whole experience and the whole community and it needs a whole of government response so there is a big challenge ahead in how we make that work um, please do join me in thanking our wonderful panelists and facilitators today for sharing their insights and experience <laughs>